I actually was up early yesterday morning, uh, and quite a number of other people were up early yesterday morning, because we were all wanted to head down to the school, because we all wanted to see the fires that had been built by our next guest, who is Francis Malman, uh, Argentina's most um, famous cook. And I think one of the things which was so interesting to see Francis is the, f the incredible fires that Francis had created for his, uh, for his feast was um, one of the very fashionable theses at the present moment. Francis Malman, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you're wondering why we're standing here um, and we have large brains, yours is bigger than mine, I'm sure, and small teeth <coughs> and small jaws, and why we are Homo sapiens rather than Homo erectus, which we were several thousand years ago, the reason the thesis goes from Professor Richard Wrangham from Harvard is fire. Because fire allowed us to cook, allowed us to eat meat, allowed us to soften food, which meant we didn't have to spend five hours chewing on a leaf for minimal nutritional benefit. And that was our race suddenly forward to becoming large-brained, small-toothed, omnivorous people. So fire, the current explanation goes, made us human, which is a kind of daunting and almost scary kind of concept. And when I was down looking at the fires yesterday morning, that the scale, the extent, that the, the ritualization, your colonization of the wood for heat, for cooking, yeah. it's really, I find it extraordinarily profound, really, really remarkable. Francis runs three restaurants in Argentina, 1884, Patagonia Sur and Garzon. Many of you will know him, of course, from the Netflix series, Chef's Table. And, um, I'm very interested in the idea, because I'm from Belfast, that you love the poem Desire in Belfast. Wonderful poem. By Sean Haldane. Yes. There you are, it's a small world. And Francis is quoted as saying, uh, one of his earlier books, Seven Fires, was described as an instant classic. And he has said about fire, fire always has a magic way of slowing things down and bringing people together. So we're all here together to listen to Francis Malman on fire. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, yes, in 50 minutes, I, I would like to talk a bit about the language of fire and cooking. Um, because I, I really believe that cooking is a craft. Um, you know, there are many talks nowadays about the art of cooking and the art of... And I, I really believe that cooking has nothing to do with art. That art is more an intellectual thing and the reason to, to eat delicious things and drink good wines is to have better conversations at the table with a friend, peers, lovers, children, or whatever. And I think that food and wine brings out the best of us. We get more witty, more truthful, um, and inspired by food and wine. And I think that the biggest beauty of it is the, the table setting. So nowadays when I, I go to sort of, not very often, but I happen to sit in very manicured restaurants and I get <clears throat> interrupted all the time by the waiter presenting the plate that you chose half an hour ago and saying, ah, I'm sorry I interrupt you. Uh, the chef says that this has so and so. I think that's very arrogant and, and boring. I think that we have to respect that beautiful climate that a table has. Um, and I think that's very important. You know, I've been cooking for 40 years almost. And when I look back into my possessions, into my assets in cooking, the one I most value is the, this silent language that cooking has and fire has, which is rooted in thousands of nights and days of cooking. And it's something that you can't explain, you can't write about, because it's actually the learning of all your senses 
into the act of cooking. And what I mean is that when we cook, we touch, we smell, we, we look, we, you know, we feel all these temperatures. And with the practice of it, with your sight, you, 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 you walk into the table of the kitchen and you see this leg of lamb and you see the, the thyme and the garlic and the olive oil and the salt and the pepper. And before you touch anything, you're, you already know quite certainly what that piece of beast is, how much it weights, uh, what will happen to it. And when, when you start seasoning it to go into a pot or to go into a fire or to go into a casserole, there's this silent language that it's very difficult to explain that just happens, you know? And if I have salt there and I just do this and throw it into a salad, I know exactly how that will taste. You know, obviously I can taste it and say a bit more or when I went over it. But I think that there is this thing you learn in cooking, which is a measuring and deciding things in your thoughts. A, and I find that a, a very beautiful silent language, that it's unexplainable. And I think it happens with every craft. I like sewing as well, you know, I find it, I don't know why, since a kid my, my grandmother taught me how to sew and I, sometimes I sew with my children. And as well, you know, the, there's that silence in every craft that you're doing something, you know what you're doing, <clears throat> You know your aim, but there's space and time to think about so many things. And I think that's, that's very, very beautiful. Now, fire mixed up with all the, of that gets even a bit more complex because I think that there is a sort of a collective memory in us of fire that is inside us long before we are born. It's like a medullar thing. It's something that it's in our guts. And you, know, and, and you make a fire and you put 20 chairs around it and you sit around kids and a soldier and a president and an artist and a cook. And there's sort of this beautiful, silent way of, of, of agreeing with that comfort and that warmth and that uh, energy of fire. And I find that one of the most beautiful things in my work. And since I started cooking quite uh, regularly with fires, like 20 years ago, um, one of my favorite things is, is to be outside. For me nowadays, even though I have restaurants, it's very difficult for me to cope cooking in a restaurant. Um, in fact, I, I go to the restaurants to teach new things. I go into the kitchen for the change of menus, but I, I don't cook in line every day, especially because um, I don't like it. You know, after I'm so spoiled with cooking in, in very remote places in nature, or like yesterday, it was so inspiring to fly into Cork on this sort of, uh, um, day with lots of clouds, drive up here in, in the sunshine. The day after that, we did the prep under the rain with all these beautiful green fields. And I was sensing, you know, the vegetables arriving on the phone with the butcher talking about the size of the ribeyes and the lamb and how did it look, was it fatty, were the kidneys there or not. And, and then next day, we had this sort of glorious, heroic day of sun and, and we just cooked and many of you were there and we had a great day. So after all that and after doing this very regularly in, in remote places in Patagonia or in different parts of South America, in North America or in Europe, I, I, it tends to be very difficult for me to, to, to stand in a kitchen even if I have a big window and, and some sunshine in. I, I really like to be outside. And I feel that what I'm trying to inform the public is a lifestyle. I really would like that children 
spend more and more time outside as we did in the past because I think that's the most nurturing and healing thing, tool for the rest of your life. When you, as a kid, spend six hours outside after maybe two at school, hopefully, uh, you, there's something you learn that, that, that sort of follows you all your life and it's, it, it's very nurturing and healing. So that's something I, I like very much. Now, as you know, the power of fire is, is huge, you know, uh, and the beauty of it is all the, the different uh, strengths it has. You know, we can make a pyre of fire with lots of wood and make a huge fire and use that to roast something very fast or to do what we call a churraco, which is a three-minute thin steak that it's slightly burnt on every side. And then once that is, is sort of burning down, you can move the ashes away in some coals and start cooking vegetables as we did yesterday. And you can bury things under the earth where the fire is burning as well, even bread, it's so delicious. And I find that, you know, I've been cooking with fire for such a long time, but I feel that I'm just starting because every day there are new things, every day there are inspirations, every day there are new things we can do. Like yesterday, we did this, this, this sort of long sausage of big as this table uh, of vegetables. It had the most incredible Swiss chard, kale, uh, beets, carrots, um, garlic, chili flakes, salt, pepper, and olive oil. And we just rolled it. It was um, thick as this. And we first smoked it on that dome for about six hours. And then we took the cheesecloth out of it and we sort of grill, grilled it on the, on the griddle for maybe an hour and a half, and, and it was quite delicious. So when I travel, and I, I travel quite often, I'm always looking at you know, the, the different techniques that every country has with cooking with fires. So uh, that's what I, I, I really like. Are there any questions? Questions? No. I'm not sure we have a microphone, do we? Or if, uh, if we have... Anybody, just while we're... No. Yeah. Yes, gentleman here, sorry, yes please. You mentioned, um, sorry, you mentioned that um, you, know, you, you considered you know, cooking a craft as opposed to an art, but I'm thinking about can it ever be an art? And in the same way as that say that writing is also a craft, but actually a really good writer can produce art. Yeah. So I don't know how you, you, your, 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 your philosophy on that are... are well, you know, maybe, maybe if you work very hard, you can become an art chef. I, I, I can't discuss that. And I think that diversity is the most important thing. But I, I, I would never want to take my cooking into a, an art because I don't want <clears throat> it to be an intellectual experience. I want it to be a human experience that enhances the relation and the talk and the wit between people who are sitting in a table and eating and drinking something delicious. For me, that's the greatest achievement. But is your, is your food, is your, your philosophy is actually enabling, um, you know, it's enabling a philosophical and a, this, this, this dining experience for, for you know, it's enabling an intellectual engagement with life because at a good table, with good wine and good company, everything is discussed, yeah? Oh yes, That's, that, 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 that can be art, but not actually the, the food. The steak and the potato has to be delicious <clears throat> to inspire everybody to have art, artist talks and intellectual talks. Fantastic, I, I, Francis. Probably I, away from time, no, no? You're, you're grand. I, I just, just one thing you want to say, I, I don't know if you said on the Netflix documentary, you said, you know, you, um, Life and, and cooking should be a path at the edge of uncertainty. Yes. The <clears> opposite <throat> of certainty, in other words. The, never the quite certain. Yeah, yeah. Well, I believe that comfort and routine and fear are things that paralyze human beings, you know, and especially comfort. You know, you're sitting in this comfortable sofa looking out the window, and I feel that it's very difficult to grow 
humanly and intellectually in comfort. I think that growth comes from walking in, at the edge of uncertainty in the boundaries of many things and a, in danger and in risk. And that's where I think we all grow. A, comfort is, I think it's, it's a bit boring. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, Francis Baldwin. Thank you very much.